Yes. Mm. Okay. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, Remo. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much uh, to Julia and the organization committee to invite me to give a talk. And it's quite a little bit of pressure to start the meeting and such an exciting meeting. And I, for this reason, I'll start a little bit more with an introduction than I would uh, like to do. But uh, I thought I'd start with a quiz. And this quiz was put together by one of my longtime collaborators, Richard Mann. And the question is, what do we see here? And um, it could be, um, my children would say clouds, abstract art, and I like most roadkill. But the truth is that these different shapes that you see here are shapes of transcription factor binding sites. So these are structures from the protein data bank where all crystal structures and NMR structures are submitted. And uh, proteins are bound to them. They are removed so you see better the shape of the binding sites. And what I left there are these little worms um, in the minor groove. Here, for instance, these little worms that are arginines. But you can see that um, there's a very, you see here, these are very different sh um, shapes. And this will be my talk today. How do these different shapes you can think of shapes in terms of um, shapes, three-dimensional shapes that children play with. How do, do these different shapes uh, contribute to transcription factors finding their target sites in the genome? Um, and I want to remind you, this is uh, the structure uh, that Watson and Crick postulated, which was a regular idealized canonical B-DNA. And uh, this is their model here. And in the background, the only figure in their paper. But uh, what proteins would really see, proteins can't read ACGT. Proteins would have to interact with the genome through chemical and physical interactions. So they interact with the surface that I'm showing here. And the surface of the molecule is actually what conveys uh, specificity. And a few years ago, we surveyed the entire, this was work with Barry Honig and Richard Mann, we surveyed the entire protein data bank, more than at the time uh, 1,000 protein DNA complexes, and we found that in addition to forming hydrogen bonds, usually in the major groove, transcription factors also in many cases uh, have N-terminal N tails or any, um, any region of the DNA binding domain that intrudes a minor groove. And the minor groove would not be as specific as a major groove in terms of forming hydrogen bonds or hydrophobic contacts. So there might, must be something else that helps transcription factors to uh, achieve binding specificity through contacts with the minor groove. And what I'm showing here this red mesh is an electrostatic potential surface at a potential of minus 5 kT. The, the number is, is, is not important. But you see that this red mesh indicates that the most negative electrostatic potential uh, surrounds the phosphates, phosphate, phosphate, and on the other a strand, phosphate, 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 and it uh, surrounds the minor groove. And we don't see as much negative electrostatic potential in the major group. And when we change the shape of this molecule, more like a clay model, so you, 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 irrespective of uh, what this clay represents, we change the, the clay shape. And we see that, I have to do it one more time, we see that the electrostatic potential changes, even though um, the chemistry obviously doesn't change. So the charges that are connected with the chemistry of the molecule don't change. But when we open the minor groove, the electrostatic potential recedes deeper into the groove, so the potential is less negative. And when we narrow the groove again, the electrostatic potential is more negative. <laughs> and this is important. In the quiz that I showed you at the beginning, you saw uh, these little worms were arginines. Arginines are positively charged residues, and that means uh, they interact through 
electrostatic interactions with these binding sites and being attracted to narrow minor groove regions will help achieving binding specificity. <coughs> I'm sorry, I need to switch this off. Um, here's shown again the two readout modes that uh, transcription factors use. On the left side, base readout, these are the functional groups, either in the major groove or in the minor groove, and these different colors are acceptors, donors, or hydrophobic methyl groups. You see that for each of the base pairs, there is a there is a, sig there, there's a, s a signature that can be recognized in the major group, whereas in the minor group, uh, proteins would not be able to distinguish AT from TA base pairs or CG from GC base pairs. But we know that, for instance, homeodomains bind into TA AT sites, and when one of the base pairs is, is, uh, is uh, rotated into the other direction, then there will be almost no binding. So minor groove plays a role, and the mechanism uh, that I just explained in the previous slide seems to be the dominant um, uh, factor here. And we call this shape readout. This can involve um, different um, geometries of minor groove, but it can also uh, involve DNA bending. Um, since uh, Gary Stormo is here, who's a pioneer in this field, I want to show a PWM, and I called my talk user manual because I see sometimes people um, e expecting maybe a little bit too much from shape readout. So I want to give you a little bit of help uh, or my, my perspective on how do, we, how do we spot when shape readout is really important. So when we see a PWM, a position weight matrix uh, visualized in this logo that looks like this then I'm at least uh, very suspect that there must be shape readout involved. If, if there would be only hydrogen bonds that are important for uh, achieving binding specificity, you wouldn't see such a mixture um, in this region, um, which is uh, four base pairs in the central region. And we don't know from looking at this motif, um, if, for instance, the T here uh, is paired with a preference of the A in the next position or of the T. I can tell you from knowing the structure of MEF2 transcription factors that when we have a T here, it would be paired with a preference of T in the next position and then again a T. And if we continue with an A, it could be either an A or T. So what I'm saying here is uh, looking at those PWMs might not, not uh, fully tell us what the interdependency between different positions in the binding site is. And there are two ways of looking at inter interdependencies. Uh, one is to go to higher K-mers, dinucleotides, trinucleotides, and so forth. And this has been done by many people in the community. Another way of uh, looking at interdependencies is DNA shape because the two adjacent base pairs that I just showed, now looking at my hands, would engage in stacking interactions that uh, decide the preference for the following base pair. When we look at the structure of MEF2 bound to DNA, then we see, in my opinion, this is a prime example for shape readout. There are very few contacts in the major group. There's one lysine that in some of the MEF2 proteins contacts uh, the edges of the base pairs in the major group. But what we see here, this, this uh, MATS and MEF2 domains are, uh, are following, are tracking the minor group. And also with, these, with the second protein, with the magenta protein on the other side of the double helix. So they read the minor group shape and they almost sit like a train on a rail uh, being the, the train being the protein, the rail being the minor groove. And when we look at which are the res residues that line the minor groove, we actually see that many of those residues are arginines and lysines that are positively charged. So they would strongly respond to any shape change 
in the, in the width of the minor groove. And this is shown here. This plot shows you in, in blue the measurement of minor groove width across the minor groove from backbone to backbone in, in blue along this binding side. I need to, I'm sorry, I need to switch this off. The, the wireless is coming back. And uh, the second plot, the red plot, I need to, it's, it's okay, right? And the red plot is a measurement of electrostatic potential in the center of the minor groove in the, in the plane of each base pair. And you see that these two entities are very, sorry, that these ent two entities are very well aligned in this plot. And then these arrows here are all positively charged amino acids that are responding to the change in the electrostatic potential in the minor groove. Um, we have in the past um, talked about a small number of DNA shape features. We just recently published a paper where we provide a larger set of DNA shape features. These are all shown here. And um, we, in the past, used, and most people in the community used the four features, minor groove width, roll, helix twist, and propeller twist that are here um, boxed in, in, these, in these red boxes. The reason for, for first publishing four shape features was I usually like simple models. I also was most convinced by those four features being uh, structurally read by proteins based on looking at the entire protein data bank. And the third reason was that we were able to valid validate the predictions of those models with our high throughput method called DNA shape um, very in, a, in, a, in a satisfying way. The other shape features are in part harder to validate. We have now validated them, but I still think that um, roll, helix twist, propeller twist, and minor groove width are the key features when we talk about uh, shape recognition. We published uh, a couple of papers that uh, contain plots like this, and some people have been criticizing us for this. Uh, I want to explain what we did here and why we did it. First of all, my first comment really is uh, we introduced shape analysis to understand and decipher mechanisms, read out mechanisms without having structures. So the goal was uh, a protein cannot be crystallized or was not crystallized by anyone and is not structurally studied. Can we use sequencing high throughput data to still understand the mechanism that it uses to read our DNA. And what we did here, we used um, machine learning models where we compare sequence models with sequence plus shape models. Uh, this worked in a way that we, for the sequence plus shape models, uh, use concat concatenated feature vectors that combine sequence features with shape features. And then we use tenfold cross-validation to predict binding specificities that in this case have been measured in high throughput Celex experiments. This is data from UC Taipalis lab and work with Ron Chamir. And uh, in case you're using uh, high throughput Celex data, in this paper, we actually published um, a tenfold deeper sequencing data set for the UC Taipalis Yorma et al. data that has previously been published. Uh, what we found here that when we compare the predictability using those models, uh, we draw a diagonal, and if shape wouldn't add anything to a sequence, then we should see all these dots lining the diagonal. Obviously, we expected it to um, achieve binding specificity predictions. That could also be achieved, and we showed in the paper, for using dinucleotides and higher k mass and I will say something about it in the, next, in the next few slides. However, our goal here was not to show that shape merely uh, improves binding specificity predictions. We wanted to see if we can pinpoint protein families that benefit more from adding shape than other families. 
And when you look carefully at the plot, you can, for instance, see that BHLH proteins that we worked on previously with Martha Bullock and Raluca Gordon, that they benefit a lot more than, for instance, in green C C2H2 zinc fingers. The reason is uh, BHLH proteins seem to be very responsive to the flanks of their binding sites because they have linkers that can contact the flanks, whereas zinc finger proteins are modular proteins where each finger recognizes free base pairs and the modularity between one finger recognizing free base pairs and the next finger uh, recognizing free base pairs might give less importance to DNA shape. We expanded this now by adding our 13 DNA shape features. What I'm showing you here, um, this is a complex figure, I apologize for it, but when we go from one mass to two mass to three mass, we improve our models on top. Uh, we also need a lot more features. We need 64 features uh, if we use three mass. Uh, when we use shape features, when we add more shape features, we also improve our models and we increase the number of features needed. Um, some people think when I talk about shape, I mean static shape. We, the, the DNA shape concept obviously includes flexibility. So when I look at a Tata box, for instance, it's a very flexible binding element and I can see that when I look at the shape features, we did this here explicitly by adding standard deviations for all DNA shape features that encode, with some limitations, um, um, conformational flexibility. These features are just hard to validate. So I want to also say um, what it really comes down to is that proteins recognize these clouds of electron density. So proteins don't read, they, they don't read ACGT, and they also don't only recognize shape. Proteins interact physically and chemically with electrons and nuclei. And um, because there's a discussion in the community, in my opinion, sequence and shape are just two different models that encode this electron density. Um, these two models are somewhat overlapping but I believe that both models add additional information, but we cannot say it's either shape or DNA sequence. And I also want to add in the next slide, when we talk about dinucleotides, the definition of a dinucleotide really depends on in which community you have been trained. So m many people uh, using sequence-based models consider dinucleotide sequence. And uh, when you go to a structural biology meeting, uh, I ask my students and they, they almost all said the dinucleotides are shape. So what dinucleotides are, they are actually both. Dinucleotides are different ways of encoding the stacking interaction between two adjacent base pairs. And I would like all of us to keep this in mind. When we, for instance, look at an AT base pair, uh, not, not a base pair, in, at an eight, APT base pair step, then we see here the stacking interaction between the first AT base pair in green and the second AT base pair in the back. And when we look at the, the opposite uh, sequence of a TA step, then I hope even though you ha might not have looked at many structures, you can see there's very little overlap here between these two base pairs in a TA step. That means, and you can find that, I promise you, you can find that in almost every crystal structure. This is a crystal structure um, that, we, that we published on Hox proteins. Uh, both, uh, both these steps occur in the same structure. And you can see the, the TA and the AT step basically say there's a different uh, um, strength and stacking, which leads to all these structural parameters that I have been mentioning. So dinucleotides represent stacking um, in one way, and helix twist and roll would uh, represent stacking in a different way at a lower dimension. I want to also now come to, this was the user manual part, I want to now come to the next steps. Obviously, DNA shape and DNA sequence are only the first 
if, if we want, uh, the first two layers that um, contribute to DNA, protein DNA binding specificity. So here we try to uh, draw a plot where we add all the different features that my lab is currently working on. So I talked about DNA shape and sequence, and I will say a few more words about some of them, uh, DNA methylation, biophysical parameters, and histone modifications. They are obviously all important, and especially when we go to the more complex in vivo situation. Um, in one recent publication, we, oh, I have, to, I have to go very quick. So in one recent publication, we um, actually developed a method where we predict electro electrostatic potential directly. Uh, DNA shape or minor group width is just a proxy for uh, electrostatic potential. So we developed a method where we predict it directly. When we look at the density of electrostatic potential over all pentamers, we see two clear peaks for electrostatic potential and more or less with, with a slight double peak on top, but more or less uh, unimodal distribution for minor group width. When we now consider that the, G, that the GC base pair contributes a positive charge through the guanine amino group, then we can explain why when we take this apart by the central base pair, we see that all AT, uh, all pentamers with central AT uh, form this peak and all GC base pairs all pentamers with central GC base perform the second peak. We would not be able to differentiate that by looking at uh, minor groove width. And when we plot electrostatic potential versus minor groove width, we see um, for red and even more for all these lighter red dots, which are part of A tract. So that ex excludes these. Um, these uh, TPA steps that have a very weak stacking interaction. We see a very strong correlation between those two entities. So using that proxy in, in our work was okay, but when we now go to the actual biophysical parameter, we get a more distinct uh, picture. We also, and I apologize, I brush over here, but we also uh, developed, recently published a method for predicting the effect of uh, cytosine methylation on DNA shape. Uh, we, we, we looked at data that was generated by Harman Bussemacher and Richard Mann in a recent cell reports paper. And in that paper, there were, for the human PBX Hox protein binding, there are three different positions where CPG ba base pair steps can occur. They explained one of them through direct contacts with a protein. Then the other two were not explained. And when we look at the bulky methyl groups that are added here in red in the major groove, they would open the major groove slightly and lead to a further narrowing of the minor groove. And we showed that when we look at the uh, binding affinity, the delta, delta, delta G, um, the one position that they had explained was increased binding through direct contacts with the hydrophobic methyl group. These two positions were not explained. But for those two, in, in, in the sequence environment that they occur, we could see that the minor group width opens uh, upon DNA methylation, which explains why there could be weakened binding. Um, we also uh, looked at histone modifications. We believe that um, the way we would like to look at it at, at different layers that lead to transcription factor binding specificity in a way we add one layer at a time and we study that layer. We did this here by using um, ENCODE data and we showed when we compare AOP, uh, area under the precision recall curve for sequence plus shape models versus sequence plus shape plus histone modification models, we see a better predictability of binding specificity. And again, we were more interested actually in mechanisms. So we wanted to see do different protein families respond differently to, the, to this added information of histone modifications. 
And we could see, we could group transcription factors in groups where, um, I hope you can see this, the first row are sequence plus shape features, and the second, uh, not row, column, are histone modifications. We could see that they're more important for some families and less important for others. We're showing here all the different sequence, shape, and histone modification patterns, and we could conclude that some families, are do the binding is dominated by histone modifications, probably by chromatin structure in this way, and others are more responsive to sequence plus shape features. In the last study, um, we looked at SNPs. Pe many people had asked us over the years, uh, have you looked at um, selection? Have you found if DNA shape is under selective pressure? So we looked at human data and fly data, and we predicted the effect of, um, of a SNP on DNA shape and compared, um, we calculated um, an Euclidean distance between the reference allele and the alternative allele, and then we, uh, we, 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 we looked at uh, the, the, the amount of DNA shape changes, how this correlates, for instance, with minor allele frequencies. We found that uh, larger changes in, chain, in shape uh, correlate with lower minor allele frequencies, so there uh, is probably a purifying selection of DNA shape. The reason for this was that there are shapes, that there are SNPs where the shape doesn't change at all. So the, the, the change of that one SNP has n almost no effect on, on, on shape, whereas for others, there's a dramatic effect on the structure. When there's a SNP here, in, for instance, in A-tract, we see a dramatic effect on, on, um, on, on, the, on, on minor group width, MGW. And one last study that I want to only mention, because it's a computational meeting, we also recently published a paper where we uh, used the quantum computer, D-Wave, the, the new D-Wave uh, quantum computer, to predict binding specificities um, in a simplified model. And now Julia is cutting me off. So I want to <laughs> summarize. <laughs> I want to summarize, and I, the summary is very short. I, I use basically my, t my title slide. I want to say it's far more complex than sequence and shape, or either of them. And um, what the mission of my lab is, uh, we want to achieve a crosstalk between different fields, in this case, genomics and structural biology. And I think um, both fields have been studying similar questions, but use different language, and there were very few people, I see few in the audience, who have, who have facilitated this crosstalk between these two communities, but it would be good to, to, to emphasize that. And I'm, yeah, I'm flashing through collaborators who I have worked with in the last, since I have started my lab, basically, and these are a lot of people. Um, I want to mainly thank my lab um, four of my students just graduated uh, last month, so if you're interested in, in hiring somebody, let me know, please. And uh, the funding agencies, and thank you very much. Time for questions. Hi, great talk, Remo. Um, I'm curious about the histone modification stuff you showed from the genome research paper this year. Yeah. So that's from ENCODE cell types, right? So, right. How, so you talk about mechanism there. How do you know that it's a mechanism of binding as opposed to a consequence of binding? We don't know, and we say that in the paper. We, we are not able to, to pinpoint the causality. The first step for us was, I think this was known, obviously known, that histone modification uh, contribute to transcription factor binding, but in my opinion, it hadn't been looked at on a protein family specific basis. And I wanted to direct that discussion a little bit uh, in the direction of let's classify it by protein families. That, that's basically all the paper does. But the causality, unfortunately, we don't know yet. Okay, so Any I'm questions? here for the rest of the meeting if you have questions, so we probably should move on. Thank you very much. Okay.